the meat packers, for example, or even a, a melon producer in the Central Valley of, of California, okay? They had an advantage. Uh, the advantage that they created for themselves was they were always willing to pay more for that labor than Wendy's was to have somebody come in and flip burgers. I'm Miriam Hoffman, a full-time college student living in Carbondale, Illinois, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, we talk with host of AgriTalk, Chip Flory. Chip is one of the most well-known broadcasters in all of agriculture, and I really don't think I could have reached out to him if my man Chris Bennett hadn't started poking me saying, hey man, you gotta have Chip Flory on there. Get him to talk about what's going on with supply chain. Get him to talk about what he sees is happening with China and corn and soybeans. So that's what we did. We sat down and we had a rip roaring conversation. And one of the best things about this conversation is that Chip and I see the world a little bit differently. And I found myself being like, wow, I had never considered that. Or the people that I'm spending time with don't think like this. And uh, Chip is so practiced and so good at explaining himself that I find him to be exceptionally persuasive. I think you're going to enjoy this podcast. Before we do that, I uh, want to... pump up the listeners to know that we are doing legacy interviews. I have started booking out for people that want to do it as a Christmas gift. So if you have thought about, hey, I'd love to have my parents or one of my children or even yourself interviewed by me to talk about your values, your family stories, ideas that you want to get captured and that you'd like to preserve in a time capsule and be able to share with future generations then you can do a legacy interview with me. People have found these to be really interesting and engaging. We can do them uh, over Zoom, just like I do this podcast right here. Or if you're in the St. Louis area, we can sit down and do it live and in person. Typically, they run a little over an hour. I'll send you some questions to get you thinking, and then we'll just have a general back and forth question and answer period. People find it to be a really fun experience. And it's one of those things that uh, most of the time when people buy it for another person, I've actually had those people that I've interviewed say, hey, could we do an extra hour? Hey, I want to do one of these for my cousin or my uh, my parents. And so it's one of those things that's built on itself and really accelerated. And I love doing it. So if you're interested in getting one of these legacy interviews and you want to get booked in time to have this be a Christmas gift, go to store dot articulate dot ventures and there you can book one of these um, legacy interviews i hope you will also if you're somebody that is enjoying these kind of conversations about supply chain earlier today i did a class on negotiations uh, sometimes we get in there and practice different speeches you might be uh, the just the kind of person that would do great in the articulate ventures network this is a group of people that came together you know a lot of broadcasters put out a patreon they say hey i'm a busker i'm going to do these interviews And if you find it interesting here, put some money in the hat to say thank you. But I didn't really want to do that. Instead, what I wanted to do was to create a community away from the tragedy of the commons with regular social media like Facebook and Twitter, where people could meet in this soft space that is uh, the Internet, but also be protected from the storms and to be able to have conversations where people are trying to understand your point. They try and give you their perspective, but it is always respectful. It's always uh, enriching and we support one another. Right now, we are in the middle of sober October, where any vice that you have that you think might be holding you back, you decide to give it up for an entire month. It could be alcohol, it could be THC, it could be caffeine, it could be nicotine, whatever you want. But you have a group of people that's around you talking about how it's difficult, talking about what they're learning, and uh, just making better life decisions. It's great to have this somewhere community that can span the world and be anywhere that you want to be. And I hope that you will... um, consider joining. If you're that type of person that wants to do that, go to network.articulate.ventures. And I think you'll be surprised at how uh, wildly diverse and interesting all of the people are. And we would most certainly welcome you. All right. Now, without further ado, let's go to host of the AgriTalk show, Chip Flory. Chip Flory, welcome to the podcast. Excellent. Thank you, Vance. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be speaking to a host of AgriTalk um, because it's oftentimes I'm talking with uh, amateurs on here. But for people that don't know what AgriTalk is, give us a rundown. What do you do day in and day out? You bet. Okay. Well, it's two hours of live radio every day. 
And uh, I know it sounds real tough, right? Work live for two hours a day. But there's a lot of prep work, obviously, that goes into that. Uh, the first hour of AgriTalk starts at 10.06 Central Time. And uh, uh, that morning hour of AgriTalk, we spend a lot of time on issues on the business side of agriculture, policy side. Uh, we talk a lot about the ethanol and the biofuels industries and and uh, livestock issues as well. Now, the afternoon hour that starts at 2.06 Central Time, we talk markets, and and that that hour of AgriTalk is something that I started back in 2014, and it's uh, it's pretty re- rewarding to have an a brand yeah I still call it it's seven years old but it's to me it's still a brand new hour of Ag Radio. So really, what we did with that that second hour, Vance, was we extended the farm broadcasters day gave them another hour of quality what i think is quality content uh, that they can expand their day so we talk issues and policy in the morning markets in the afternoon we've got over 100 uh, affiliate stations out there and then of course we've got the podcast and and it we turn our our live show into a podcast and you can get that off of agritalk.com you can get that off of the uh, agritalk app so I've known you for a long time. You're a well-known quantity in the ag world, but it didn't come to my attention that I should interview until uh, my man Chris Bennett popped up <laughs> and he said, man, you have got to sit down and talk with Chip Flory. So you and I had a phone call the other day yeah. where I was in uh, apocalypto <laughs> mode yeah. where Facebook was down and we're looking at supply chain issues, um, really, I think, only just beginning mm-hmm. and uh, just wondering what the world is going to look like. As you look out in the world... How apocalyptic are things to you right now? Well, we got Facebook back, so things are worse now than they were when <laughs> Facebook was down. Um, no, it, it, uh, we've got Facebook back, and, and there's a lot of issues that I think we're trying to figure out when it comes to social media and, and just what exactly are their responsibilities. I mean, they, they came up as a social media site, and people want to make them publishers. And that's not what they are. They're not publishers. Uh, pub- published pieces um, have responsibilities, have uh, an obligation to the public that social media, we're trying to assign those responsibilities and those obligations to social media and trying to police that. I, I have no idea how they would, how, how they would accomplish that uh, on the supply side. Uh, or the supply chain interruptions. I heard a stat the other day that just gave me chills, Vance, after we talked. And that was India was down. India, India still produces most of their electricity with coal, and they were down to a four-day supply of coal. If that doesn't scare scare you, I I, I don't know what would. Uh, it's it's. Uh, the the supply chain situation and 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 look at the look at the issues that it's created vance we've got all those boats sitting off of uh the the huntington beach out in southern california and one of them dropped a damn anchor on a pipeline and now we've got an oil spill it it it's it's um it's creating issues in getting product onto the store shelves and there are these residual issues that are coming along with it that they're just impossible to predict. Yeah, it seems like we're positioning ourselves when you get into a situation where things are stretched thin, that even the smallest little hiccup can turn into these uh, wild uh, backups. You know, well, it's kind of like uh, when you when a wreck happens on the interstate, it's not just the wreck that does the backup. It's all the cars that slow down to yeah. see the, the backup and then all that backing up. And so even though maybe the, the accident was cleared up in a matter of 20 minutes, that um, that traffic congestion can go on for hours afterwards well, and when you're talking about supply chain that yeah. stack on is going to go for months years even yeah the accident accident can happen in the southbound lane but it's going to slow down traffic in the northbound lane as well and so that's uh, uh something that we have to watch and you know you think about the way that the ag trade has evolved over the years it it, it when i got involved in in reporting on what's going on in agriculture back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, 
countries that were dependent on imports built up a stockpile and held onto that stockpile. Then it became a, a just-in-time delivery market. We started calling it a FedEx market. Well, that was, was transferred with Amazon over to consumer life and everyday life. Everything is, uh, you don't order anything until you need it. Well, now a lot of those products are sitting out there on boats that, and if it's, if they're not sitting out there on those boats off of Huntington beach, the packaging for the items that you want is sitting in those boats out there. And they're sitting on containers that, uh, the just in time delivery that we had had developed in agriculture and in the economy Vance, it's been disrupted and it's going to be disrupted for quite some time. Yeah, you know, I think um, we're going to look back on the period of time where we said everybody should go get an MBA. We should just have all of these um, business students and they should study how to make things more and more efficient. I think we're going to look back and we're going to say that was probably an ideological mistake because yeah. I think that so much of the, the, um, outsourcing came as a result of saying, you know, we can, we can shave this little bit of storage cost off. We can shave this amount of us having this liability on our books. If we just make sure we wait a little longer, we have it produced somewhere else, or we make it say on somebody else's books. And I think that it's, uh, it's a little bit like when, uh, agriculture, when, um, the people are too young, the people running the farms are too young to remember when interest rates went wild, or they don't right. remember the, the savings and loan crisis. You you, you just don't even realize because it's not on their radar screen to be thinking about how bad this could get. And I don't think we've felt the punishment yet that we're going to feel for having made all of these uh, giant radical changes. Yeah, it's been a pursuit of efficiency. And as we've been pursuing that efficiency in agriculture in the supply chain, you know, great example of it is what we we're talking about on, on a regular basis now, it seems like, and that's the cattle market and the cattle pricing transparency and, and transparency into these uh, alternative marketing agreements. And uh, part of the problem with the, with that pursuit of efficiency is that it has locked us into and, and evolved us into some positions that I, that a lot of people just don't want to be part of. And when you look at those those four big packers out there that are into these AMAs, the alternative marketing agreements, and nobody outside of the packer and the cattle producer that is the other side of the AMA, nobody really knows exactly how that price was constructed. I don't even know what you're talking about. Tell me all about this oh, AMA. Oh, okay. Alternative marketing agreements. You've got negotiated uh, cash cattle trade. That happens primarily in the northern production areas, okay, Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, some of Nebraska, outside of the major feedlot areas where we talk more about farmer feeders. That is where so much of the day-to-day -day negotiated cash cattle trade takes place. When you get into the southern market, where feedlots might have 50,000 head, might have 300,000 head, might have 600,000 head, negotiating on a daily basis is is kind of difficult more difficult for those large producers um for a couple of reasons and it, and most of it comes down to logistics uh, you can't run 50,000 head of cattle and just decide you know what we're going to negotiate uh, uh, uh by the load on 60 head per load we're going to negotiate that every day you can't do it because you're going to have multiple multiple loads that need to go every day. Well, those cattle, you need to make the plans to move those cattle. So you, you negotiate a price, you set a price based on a formula that is going to be driven by the quality of that animal as it makes its way from the uh, hamburger into the steaks and, and everything. So uh, the it's, I, I've had so many conversations about the complexity of the cash cattle market and the the cattle trade that you you I, I've started to buy into the idea that it is a complex issue and it um, 
it has evolved to the point that in the, in, in a pursuit of efficiency that we have got part of the part of the cattle the the guys that raise cattle just are convinced that it's a fixed business and there there's nothing good about the the marketing side or the pricing side of the business all the way down to hey this is the way it is because if we can't make plans to move cattle when they need to be moved or from the packers perspective if we can't if we don't know where those 5000 head that we're going to process every day are going to be coming from um it it becomes a, a a supply chain issue and the disruptions that we saw in 2020 vance uh, because of the labor issues and the and uh, covid in the workforce it it just blew this this cattle industry up and has created uh, uh, a situation where about half of the industry is looking for some sort of a legislative fix to, or I, I, I say fix, which implies that it's broken. And I, I do, I'm not convinced that it's broken. They want- well, that's it. That's an interesting point because yep. the, when you listen to my, a lot of my listeners are kind of the edgy, edgier people, right? They're the yep. independent ones. They want to be out on the range. They're in Oklahoma. They're out yep. in the plains of Kansas. And uh, to them, it is so obvious that uh, the only way to fix this is with somebody that has as much power as the four packers, which is the only thing that's as powerful as that is the government because yeah. you can't get all these independent cattle ranchers uh, together to focus on something. And I think they have a really interesting point. Like their checkoff programs somehow started uh, bringing together packers and cattlemen and uh, they have different interests. In fact, those are two different sides of the, of the bargaining mm -hmm. table. And so a lot of them feel like, how are we going to join together enough uh, interest to be able to, to push back on the Packers? Cause any yeah. one of us, any five of us, any hundred of us could just get pushed off the, off the board um, by the Packers. Cause they're so much larger than us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and th this all comes down to, to a question that most cattlemen ask themselves at, at some point. And, and that is, if you ask that that feed yard operator, okay, he's finishing cattle, you ask him, are you producing cattle or are you producing beef? And about half of them will say beef, the other half will say cattle. If you go down to the cow-calf producer and ask them the same question, about three quarters of them are going to say, well, I'm producing calves. The other quarter will say, I'm producing beef. And it's that disconnect between a beef market and a cattle market that has put us into the situation that we're in right now. And we've got these, you know, the, 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 the cattle industry and the cattle herd goes through about a 10 year cycle. And, and that 10 year cycle can be disrupted by things like drought. Uh, the, the, the cattle market can be as much of a weather market as the corn market can be. And, we we but basically there's a 10 year cycle to the to the size of the 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 cow herd that's out there well of course that's going to correlate with a 10 year price cycle out there as well because when we've got the smaller cat uh calf crops we're going to have a higher price in the years following so it's all about the balance between processing capacity and the size of the the market the the, the the market cattle that are out there and available to the processors. So, but the question is then have the big four reduce slaughter capacity to the point that they will have leverage and have leverage forever. And you, that's why the industry may be the best answer to what's going on out there is to add slaughter capacity. The problem is if you add the slaughter capacity and the government's doing what they can, they're putting $500 million into advance in grants and loans uh, to, to increase slaughter capacity, primarily for beef. If we do that, and then all of a sudden we start to cycle down on cattle numbers, those two things are going to collide at some point, Vance. And, and all the, 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 
uh, leverage is going to be with the feed yard at that point. And we're going to be looking at packers that are losing money big time because they're going to have to pay too much for the cattle compared to what the retail price can be out there for, for the steaks and the hamburger. So the 500 million that's out there that you're talking about mm -hmm. with grants, is this to create the, you know, the Muncie meats of the world where you have uh, a tiny, you know, slaughtering facility, maybe yeah. you're doing 20, 30 head of cattle a day, something like that. Oh, or even smaller than that, uh, 20 head a week. Uh, th that money is available to, to, all sizes of processing facilities, you know, the old small Muncie lockers uh, out there that that are available. I just had a conversation on AgriTalk with um, uh, Todd Herzog, who is uh, running the beef plant down in Butler, Missouri. They're doing about 50 head a week and they've got a branded product that is available in retail locations. Uh, they've got the the online ordering system. They're doing um, they're, they they are doing uh, 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 processing for other small outlets in Nebraska, in Iowa. So th there's a lot of potential there, but we don't need one Herzog Meat Company or or Mocan Livestock Company. What we need is about fifteen of them then it starts to make a difference. Vance, we're only talking about 600, 700 head a week. That's 10 loads. That's 10 loads of cattle a week. But if we can take those away from the, from the packers at a time when they're set up to handle those 10 loads, all of a sudden they start to compete a little more aggressively for the loads that are out there. We, we could see some increase in negotiated trade, it, it's a slaughter capacity issue right now is, is I think what we're dealing with. So where do you think two years from now, the cattle markets will be, <laughs> will it be in the same spot? Will they be radically yeah. different? No. Yes. I think we're going to be radically different in two, two years, Vance. Uh, we're going to have more slaughter capacity and a smaller supply of market ready cattle. And the, the leverage will be with the feed yards. And I think Packers, uh, the money that the Packers have been making over the last 24 maybe 30 months, uh, it, they're not going to be making that money. It, and the, the, we, we, we tend to ignore the retail side of it as well, because the retailers out there, they know that if they put a price out there, say, you know, ribeyes at the meat case in, in Iowa right now are 18 bucks a pound. We, that's the highest I've ever seen them. Now, if the beef price backs off, is the retailer going to back that price off? When they're selling all the re all the ribeyes that they can get at eighteen dollars a pound, are they going to back that off? No way, no way. So the the goal of of everything that that we need to see happen is we need to move more of that retail dollar through the processor back to the feed yard, back to the backgrounder, back to the cow calf guy, back to the seed stock producer. And right now, <laughs> uh. Too much of it is sitting with the packer. We need to move more of it down the chain. So, you know, when you think about what happened with COVID, there was uh, suddenly it revealed that things like pork, uh, you know, you have 48 hours between when that pig is killed and when it's in the grocery store. And if you stop slaughtering, then in, almost instantly you start running out of, out of pork products. Right. Is that ever going to get solved or do we just live in a world where we're doing just in time Dude. and that's just the way it is? Dude, when... <laughs> In the hog industry, when when they decide that they're going to farrow that pig, if they're in a fair to finish operation, which not a lot of producers are, but if if they're in a fair to finish operation, the day that they decide to breed that hog, they're booking the truck to take that hog to to market five months later. Okay, well. Actually, four months and two weeks or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Gestation period is three months, three weeks and three days. It, it, but tack another five months on top of that. So go eight months out. They're booking trucks to take that that pig to market. That's how finely tuned the hog side of things are. And um, uh, I don't know how we can bust that up. We're. We're, we're killing 2 million head a week, uh, processing 2 million head a week. Uh, I, to, to be able to do that, 
I'm not sure that we can go backwards. And if we do go backwards, uh, uh, there's going to be regional shortages and uh, it, it, the efficiency is incredible. We don't, you know, when you're living in the city, I live in St. Louis, you don't see the pigs at all. I mean, you probably don't even really, if you're in the, in the countryside, because it's just so vertically integrated. Yeah. It's so removed from everything. But it is shocking when you come to realize pork meat is actually the most consumed meat in the world, right? In the world. Now. And yeah. I mean, that, that includes two different religions that have complete, you know, abstinence. You can't have it if you're Jewish and you can't have it if you're Muslim. And right. yet it is super high demand. And when you start looking at those numbers, if you have a, a chink in the overall pork production, scary things happen real fast. Like, you know, um, I, I used to study under a, a Chinese professor mm -hmm. and he always talked about one of the reasons that the current Chinese regime is in power is because in people's lives, they went from eating meat once during holidays, you know, maybe two times per year to then doing it once per month and once per week. And he describes like, you know, wealth is is one part in your bank account. But a whole nother thing is when you start eating meat more regularly, right. that makes you feel wealthy. So if you have a country like China that realizes the stability of the government relies, it's completely dependent on can you continue to give people meat not only regularly, but more regularly in the future, you know, continue to drive that price down. The, the, um, the amount of power that rests on the shoulders of agriculture is really uh, almost indescribable, but it's water. Right. We don't even see it in our day-to-day -day lives. Right, right. That's exactly right. So enter African swine fever in China and the disruption that that created to the supply. <laughs> Their sow herd is five times the size of, of the U.S. sow herd. Oh, I didn't it, realize that. It, yeah, it was. It was at, at one point. Uh, it it was broken down because of African swine fever to, you know, they the, the estimates are that they lost about 40% of their total herd. They've been building that back up, but they've lost some of the efficiencies that they had established. They are westernizing, uh, modernizing their, their feeding system so that instead of having the, the small farmers with backyard operations scattered all over the country. Uh, they've even, they've even gone to hog finishing condos where there's five levels of, of hog production in one facility. If I'm working in that facility, I think I want to work on the top level, but <laughs> just mention that, but uh, the, the, they are modernizing it. They're not feeding swill or scraps or garbage to it in those commercial facilities. It's a, uh, it's very much a, an Iowa style feed that they are feeding those hogs in those commercial facilities now. So look at, at it, it, this, what's happening in China is making your point Vance. And, and when it was, when it is so important to the Chinese people, uh, that supply of pork when it is disrupted to the point that it was, and they are bringing it back under a completely different production method. And it is being done with the level of government support that it is being done with. That proves your point, just how important agriculture is to a political structure like they've got in China to maintaining a happy uh, citizenship uh, or citizenry. If, if, if those people aren't happy, you get one guy standing in front of a tank on Tiananmen square again and raising all kinds of issues. And then boom, you, you, they can't lose control. Well, so this uh, brings me to a conspiracy theory that I've heard. I'd love to run it past you, which is the reason that we are so behind on nitrogen and uh, some of the other, you know, the, the phosphate that we need to be able to keep growing corn is because the Chinese are trying to uh, gum up that system because they want the American farmer to grow more soybeans to send it over as feed. What do you think of that uh, hypo or that conspiracy theory? Um I think that the, the amount of investment that China has made into the South American soybean system would probably argue against that. The, the, there's also the fact that China in, in just the 2020-21 marketing year, they've, always, they've been a buyer of small amounts of, of U.S. corn. Uh, I would call it very small amounts leading up to that 2020-21 marketing year. That's when they stepped in and they bought like 26 million ton 
a, a, a huge amount of corn, 700, 800 million bushels. I think that China, China for, for decades has had a mission of being self-sufficient on three crops, rice, wheat, and corn. Soybeans, they just farmed that out. They 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 sent the investment dollars to to South America and built up that that production system in Brazil. Uh, they're to the point now where they will continue to support the Brazilian uh, system as much as they can, and and they'll go as far as investing in their in the uh, Brazilian infrastructure, railways, barges ports on the Amazon, do whatever they can to make sure that they are giving all the incentives possible to the Brazilian producer to, to continue to expand their production. But they're going to have to rely on countries other than Brazil for corn. U.S. is the number one spot. They can look to Argentina, but Argentina is so screwed up anyway, fans. I mean, I don't I don't know how, how we anybody could rely on getting supplies out of Argentina. Ukraine, that's another source. Uh, China has done deals in the past with Ukraine where they've sent goods into Ukraine in exchange for corn. So they're willing to barter <laughs> on a global basis for corn out of Ukraine. And I I just think that uh, there I don't think that China would want to gum up that fertilizer system and supply chain too much, because if they do, they're going to be threatening their own corn supply and the and the corn that they can buy from the from the United States. I don't. I don't. Think okay, do so if not that, what in the hell is going on? Why are nitrogen prices flying through the roof? And where where does this take us? In if you uh, can't if you can't natural, get enough nitrogen to grow good corn, it's natural gas, man. It's natural gas. We've gotten to the point where we have discouraged the production of crude oil and, and natural gas and the use of those products uh, to the point that we've created some real issues out there. In Europe, they they went as hard as they could after wind energy and after solar energy. And in the summer of 2021, they found out that wasn't enough. Uh, and, and they had to tap into their natural gas refire some of those shuttered uh, electricity plants that that would burn on natural gas and and refire those plants well that got their stocks so low we think natural gas prices are high in the united states right now they're three times four times the price in in europe uh if if you would take the natural gas price that they are paying in europe right now and make it the equivalent in crude oil prices, it'd be like $175 a barrel crude is what they're paying for natural gas. It's shocking. You can't do that. You have to make decisions at that point. Do we continue to use natural gas to pull the nitrogen out of the air and make anhydrous, or do we stop doing that? And they've stopped doing that. Uh, the issue then becomes what kind of a winter are we going to look at? There are some forecasters out there that are predicting a. it may not last a long time, but there's going to be some very harsh conditions this winter because of La Nina and, and the weather trends and the way that the polar vortex has been flowing and blah, blah, blah. Uh, if, for an example of what might happen, just go back to February of this year, Vance, and, and what happened down in Texas. If, if if we get that big push of cold air that far south again, and we've got a, an energy system, an electricity system that is as stressed as what they dealt with down in Texas. Now, take that and put that over all of Europe. What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do if something like that happens? So they've got to start to stockpile natural gas and rebuild it for heating use. That means shutting down nitrogen production in a lot of cases, not only in Europe, but but in in uh, the United States as well. So what does this do to corn production? You know, if you're a farmer, you're sitting on, let's say, 2000 acres, you got to decide now whether you're going to be locking in prices on nitrogen and buying corn or you're going to you're looking at beans. How do you make that decision? Yeah, 
it's not easy. That's for sure. I mean, uh, the, uh, the guys at Purdue university, Jim Mintert is ag economist there at Purdue university. He and Michael Langemeyer, uh, put together with the CME, I should say, uh, they put together the, uh, uh, ag economy barometer. And in that ag economy barometer, it's a monthly survey of 400, I think it's 400, might be 600 uh, producers across the country. Not always the same producers, they mix it up. So they get a, 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 a wide representation of views out there. The There's about a third of the producers now, 34% think that input costs on their 2022 corn production is going to be up more than 12% from one year to the next. The, normally, Jim told us that they're looking at, a, normally the, the increase is about 1.8 to 2%. So this is sixfold the increase in cost of production from 21 crop to 22 crop. It's gonna have an impact on acres. It's It's got to, it's got to. Yeah, I mean, I I uh, regularly put out on Twitter questions about supply chain, and the other day I put one out about uh, how much has it impacted prices for you, and I'm hearing things like I'm paying 17% more for, for nitrogen than I did last year, some people saying, you know, even way bigger than that, and, and you look at that and you say, okay... Part of this is natural gas. Part of this is inflation, right? Yes. What, what we pumped up the, the monetary supply so much that there is so much liquidity in the market that people have money, they just don't have goods. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much, how much, uh, you, now all, if you're going to get those things, you can start charging what you want for it. And I think, I think the general oh, consumer is it. not, you, you just said it, Vance, uh, it, it, for, for, for a long time, there was, a. Uh, a direct connection between the price of natural gas and the price of nitrogen fertilizers. All right. Then the guys producing nitrogen realized, well, you know what, really what we should be doing is pricing nitrogen according to what the, the buyers, farmers are willing to pay for it. Not so much what it costs to produce it. So it's what the market will bear. Uh, we we're, we're, we're reconnecting production of nitrogen to the price of natural gas. Now, are we going to be willing to pay a thousand bucks a ton for anhydrous in the spring of 2022 to plant corn? At six dollar corn, probably. At five dollar corn, now nah, I'm backing away from it. And what are the futures at right now? And so today is uh, about Thursday, October seventh. Okay, about, about five thirty-five. Yeah, yeah. So got a ways to go to to hold on to all those acres that we need. But demand for bean acres is going up too, Vance. We can't forget that. I uh, I think that people, uh, so, you know, the first to react to higher prices or to actual inflation are actually the ones, the people that benefit the most, right? If And I think, you know, Economics 101, the, the cure for supply chain problems is just higher prices, right? If you have supply problems, just start ratcheting up that price and eventually people that aren't willing to pay. And I mean, I think if we look at why is it that the local Panera or the, the you know, restaurant or gas station near me doesn't have employees, it's because people have not been willing to increase the prices to be able to compensate for the labor costs. Right. And I think that that's coming. And it, it's something that we as Americans are resisting because you, you say we've we've had relatively stable prices. Certainly they've gone up 3% for you know year after year after year after year. But I think we've got a huge bump coming and it's going to be sticker shock and nobody wants to raise prices so much because if you raise them up in the grocery store down the street or the restaurant down the street doesn't then then you've got problems but eventually you're just not going to have the employees you need to be able to get the things done yeah and it, it's um the increase in competition for that laborer is it, it, we're, we're seeing a shift because it, the, the meat packers for example or even a, a melon producer in the central valley of of california okay they had an advantage. Uh, the advantage that they created for themselves was they were always willing to pay more for that labor than Wendy's was to have somebody come in and flip burgers. Well, Wendy's is now paying what 
the meat packers or the melon producers were. And they either have to take a bite out of their margins and pay more again to bring those workers in, or we need to figure out some other way of doing it. Now, I think in many ways, we're going to figure out different ways of doing it. And this is back to the disruptions of, of the, the processing that we saw in and the, and the availability of labor in 2020 because of the pandemic, there's a big push going on out there to, um, you know, automate the processing of, of cattle and automate the processing of hogs. The problem is they don't always, they, they don't all fit in the same cookie cutter and you, it needs in many ways, processing those animals still needs the human touch. In many ways, still picking only the ripe melons takes a human touch. And it, it's, it's what it means is there, we're going to take a bite out of the margins uh, all the way around and, and going to have to pay more for labor in agriculture. That's the bottom line. And it's going to be, it's it's going to make its way down the supply chain to the retail side and higher grocery bills. But that's hey, we're we're talking about inflation, but energy and food don't count for inflation because it's just stuff that you need. Yeah, yeah the the way that it, inflation gets counted in the U.S. is is so Stupid. absurd is to be a, a farce, right? Like they aren't right. even including health care. Like <laughs> it, it's it's like that's you know everything the you need expense. they don't count yeah, exactly. Yep. So let's talk about, uh, you know, what's going on in the ag media world. It's uh, It seems as though, I think if you're a- out on Twitter or uh, social media and you're in the ag space, you think, hey, the modern um, media giants, you know, your CNNs, your, even your Foxes, but your MSNBC, they all seem to be pretty woke. And the messages that you hear on TV does not resonate with the ground truth of what people on the ground believe. Is this going on in, in ag as well? Is there a, a push for kind of a, a, like a woke mentality? Oh yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's definitely happening and whether, I don't know if you've even got a choice Vance to decide if you're going to come along for the ride or not. I, I, I think it's, it's a movement that we're, 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 everybody is kind of caught up in. And the thing is, boy, you, you make a mistake. It can be completely innocent. It can be, be unintentional, but if you make a mistake, somebody's going to call you out. And it, it's a uh, part of the woke movement is the cancel culture, right? Where if you make that mistake, they're gonna somebody's gonna try to cancel you, and it's too much fun for people. It's almost turned into sport to say, "Did you see what Vance said? We can't allow that to happen." As a matter of fact, we can't allow Vance to even talk anymore. Uh, it's those kind of movements that take place that just kind of scare you. And the thing is, you, it, it, it's um, out, on, out on social media, everybody's got a voice, which is great. But that doesn't make everybody a journalist. It, 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 as, it, there's responsibilities, there's obligations, as we were talking about. And the responsibilities and the obligations of a journalist, like I, I – I'd put you obviously into that category because you're having conversations that, that are based in realities in, in many ways you get out on social media, sometimes Vance and reality has nothing to do with with what they're talking about. And it, as, as a, a journalist, we, we've got to stay in (laughs) reality matters. That's the bottom line is reality matters. And we just have to continue to remind people about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I I remember on uh, social media not that long ago, there was a young woman. She just recently gotten married. I've known her for quite a few years. She was um, kind of complaining about the old boys network, which really the old boys network doesn't benefit anybody but the old boys. So you could be right. a man or a woman, but if you're not in the crew, it doesn't benefit right. you. So I had made some kind of comment that, I, you know, in my mind, it was something like, uh, you know, um, very complimentary. I was like, you know, you're, you're really tough. You can take it, you know, you can handle this. And it was like me, I, you know, I wouldn't say anything that I thought was offensive or was like trying yeah. to put her down. And man, I, I got all these people that were just delighted with the fact that I had maybe made some implication that a woman should have to take uh, crap from men and that she should just, you know, suck it up and deal with it. And it was like, uh, you know, the, the, I didn't take the bait, but I definitely got DMS from people that were like, you, I want you to tell me right now what it is that you meant when you were saying this to her. I, I want to, I demand to know, you know, why she should have to take it. And I'm like, at one, I don't have to take the bait because there's nobody you can yeah. report on me too. But like, uh, you just saw the glee and the excitement that people yeah. had that they gotcha. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the, the gotcha conversations. Um, uh, and, and the thing is, uh, they're, as I said, it, it feels like it's more of a movement now than, than everything. And, I, and um, sometimes a movement, I, you would like to think that it's that, that that movement is part of evolution and we're all moving in the right direction at the right time for the right reasons. But when it's sport to just gotcha, I don't think that's moving in the right direction. Yeah. Progress for progress's sake is a little like, uh, yeah. you know, going hiking without a map or without a compass and not yep. really having a goal. You're just, you know, going out into the woods, you get pretty yeah. lost. Yep. That's right. So That's right. as you look out, you know, the ag world, you've been in the game for quite a while. Uh, what do you think is going to be different about farms in the next 10 years? Do you think we're mm -hmm. going to see a huge consolidation? Is China going to own all the land? Is it going to just be run by farm managers? What do you think? Um, obviously there's going to be changes. We keep talking about uh, the average age of farmers and how it's at the point now where uh, there's going to be this huge turnover in land ownership at some point. Uh, we've been talking about this huge turnover in land ownership for 30 years. And in reality, it, it in Iowa, uh, when you think about landowners and and who it really is, in many cases, it's the widow at the nursing home. Yeah, something um, like sixty percent of all the land right now is owned by women widowed over the age of sixty-five or something right, like that. Right. Okay. So we need to keep that in mind. But there's another generation of kids coming behind them that have probably learned and seen the advantages of land ownership and what they can do for you. Now, will those kids, do, do they all have the same attitude? And if the farm is, is passed down one third, one third, one third to the three kids, do they all have the same attitude of, yeah, this is great. We've got this wealth in this ground that it, it's passive income for us. We don't have to do anything. The rent check shows up. Um, are they going to have that attitude or are they going to have the attitude of uh, land prices are bumping records, if not at records? Let's go ahead and cash this thing out before a Biden tax plan comes in and makes it impossible for us to hold on to it anyway. Um, a lot of issues uh, uh, on in farming that are tied to that wealth that is stored in the ground. So what happens to this ground over the next 10 years? And will there be this big transfer of ownership? If that transfer of ownership happens, Vance, then farming is going to look a lot different, I think, in 10 years. If it transfers to farmers, to active farmers, look at how the ground is sold now. It, it used to be that if you had a 320-acre farm, you sold 320-acre farm. Now, when that 320-acre farm goes to auction, it's, it's divided up into 40 acres here and 80 acres there and 60 acres here and 20 acres there. So it's, it, it's done in all these parcels. There, it, those farms, you, it may go to one buyer, all the parcels. 
but the availability of 20 acres here, 80 acres there, does that start to spread out ownership to some of the smaller farmers and create not consolidation, but actually diversification of ownership in, in the land out there with the desire of consumers to, and I, I think this is still accurate. It was very accurate before the pandemic. And I think it's still accurate that, that consumers are wanting to reconnect with the source of their food. If that's the case, local is going to be, is going to be a, a, a real thing again. At least regional is going to be a thing again. And I think that that may actually break up some of the farm ownership, put it, put ground in more hands and give us smaller, more localized marketing farmers in the future. Wow, that is a very different perspective from everything I've heard. And it's an mm -hmm. interesting one to consider. I, I agree. You know, you know, if you're going to start gr growing for the farmer's market, you don't need 300 acres. You need, you know, you need 10, you 10. need 15. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, and, and too much more than that becomes really unwieldy for a, for a vegetable farmer. It, I think it, a lot of the... Oh, and, but Vance, if, if you're talking about some of those farmer markets, some of the revenue potential on a, a per acre basis... Uh, at those farmer markets and in, in the specialty markets, the revenue potential is outstanding. Can that, that person that is farming for a very local market, can they afford, if all they're doing is buying 20 acres of the 320 that's offered, they can maybe go in there and afford to pay more on a per acre basis than a commercial farmer. Wow, that is super interesting because the 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 big concern that I hear people talking about all the time is just consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. And when I look at something like uh, ASF MRA, you know, the the Society yep. of Farm Managers, I mean, they are growing hand over fist. They have more yep. and more members because there's so many more acres being run by farm managers as opposed to farmer owner occupied. Um, but I, I see your point. So, tax policy is going to have so much to do with this, fans. If if the if tax policy gets in the way of putting ground on the market, that consolidation is the way that it's going to be. Okay. Because it's going to take somebody that owns ground outright and a lot of it to be able to buy a piece of ground at the price that's going to be required on that piece of ground to help the sellers pay the taxes. Now, if the tax policy encourages uh, though that ground to move to the market, then I think it gets broken up. I think it gets broken up because I, I, I do believe that, that the pandemic has been a disruption in, in so many ways, but I think it's also been a disruption in the consumer's wants and desires. And I think we will get back to the consumer wanting a locally sourced meal on their, on their plate uh, in the future. It's funny because uh, my wife and I, we moved from D.C. to, to St. Louis and, you know, got much more in touch with agriculture as I got involved with Monsanto. But now all of the friends that I had that were still living in the major cities, mm -hmm. um, at least on the coast, almost all of them have decided to move away from the coasts and try and move closer to places where they can they can be a part of the whether it's the food system or the local community and i'm not sure if that's just a function of hey this is what my generation is doing um or the pandemic or some part of it but it it, it seems like the motion has started moving towards like an internal you know, movement, but yeah. you know, the coasts are still growing. There's still people out there. Yeah. Well, if yeah, th that's, that's exactly true, but there is a, a migration. You look at what's happening in Billings, Montana, for example, uh, they can't build a house fast enough in Billings, Montana to keep up with it. Boise, Idaho. There's another one. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Urbandale, Iowa, Ankeny, Iowa, uh, the, the movement is definitely happening. Now, I will say this. If you're coming from the East Coast or the West Coast to the middle of the country, remember that hog manure has a smell. All right. 
Rem remember that dust flies in the spring and in the fall. Remember that, that uh, the very, very heavy loads that are going up and down county roads move slowly. Uh, the, the conflicts have been well documented over the years, but what you're talking about, Vance, is only the potential for even more conflicts in, in the future. So, so tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the publishing world that you're in, you know, you're yeah. doing live radio all the time. You've got to stay up on things. How do you, how do you stay up with it and how do you keep it from consuming you? Man? Uh, well, number one, um, you, you really don't stop it from consuming you it, it, on the air for two hours and, and prep time never stops. Um, it, 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 I mean, I find time. Don't get me wrong. I find time. I've got three grandkids and I love spending time with those grandbabies. Um, so I find time for that. Uh, I, I find time every evening uh, to to take a break. And uh, I do that by cooking supper. I, I, I'm the cook in, in our family, in my household. And, and I love it because it gives me a chance to take a break, but when I'm done with it, you know, I might sit down in front of the TV, but I've got my computer open. I'm, I'm looking at, at, uh, uh, different reports, trying to stay on top of, of everything that's, that's going on out there. So you, it's it's uh it's two hours of live radio and and uh away from sleeping you're prepping and that's that's the bottom line were you born to do this were you always mm -hmm. destined to get into broadcast or is this something that you had to build your way to um my mom was a journalist for 70 years <laughs> believe it or not 65 we'll call it um and I never, it, she was a rural correspondent for, for county newspapers, stuff like that. And I, I never, I don't remember a time that, that journalism and reporting wasn't part of my life because it was, it was right there in front of me all the time. Uh, mom worked at home, worked on a typewriter, worked on, and eventually on a computer. But, uh, so from that perspective, uh, I was, I, I come by it pretty naturally. It's always been a part of my life. The farming side of things, uh, again, I grew up on a farm, but we, we were a fair to finish operation. We had a cow calf operation, corn, soybeans. Uh, my brother is 10 years older than me and, uh, uh, got, he and dad got caught caught up in the crisis in the late seventies, early eighties, had a farm sale in 1980 when I was a South, when I was 15 years old and, and, you know, 15 years old, you're just kind of old enough to, to understand what's going on, but you had to make an effort to really understand. Well, I kind of made that effort. And, and when you see what, what happened in so many cases uh, in, in the late seventies, early eighties, um, the, the farm crisis was very real. The, the, uh, it, it amplified it, whatever, uh, when it became a rural banking crisis. Uh, if the banks would have stayed in good shape, the forced foreclosures wouldn't have happened. And, and I know that this, this may sound obvious, but the banks, at that time got themselves into the problems and made it a bigger problem for a lot of farms out there. Farms that were generating revenue, they were making their payments. They were making payments with 16, 18% interest and they were making the interest and the principal payments. Okay, so it was happening. Uh, but when the banks got in trouble, that's when they transferred their problems to the ag business and, and to the farm businesses as well. So uh, that's when, it, you know, farmers, farmers in the late seventies, early eighties, Vance, uh, they would have a conversation one afternoon with their bank president or whatever uh, bank owner. And they'd say something like, Vance, you're doing great. Look at this. Let's go over your books. Wow. That's fantastic. Everything is going just fine. The next day after a board meeting, you might get that phone call, Vance. It says, Vance, we need to talk because you're upside down. You're upside down and we're calling it now. Um, 
the way that the the that the rules changed overnight for so many farmers out there uh it it was it was just heartbreaking so i grew up on a farm i loved everything that there was to love about farming but after seeing that and understanding how fast the rules can change on you i really didn't want anything to do with that side of it what i wanted to do was to help farmers understand the risks that they face how to manage those risks and uh, and how 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 to be better businessmen out there so uh, the journalism side the broadcasting side did it come natural i'd love to talk you you can you can see that the the journalism side comes to me natural the interest in farming comes to me natural but it was very much by design how i ended up where i ended up um when i was a senior in high school i had a conversation with an editor bob kaufman uh, at uh, Pro Farmer, Professional Farmers of America, because uh, a couple of years before that, Dad and I were going to town. He was driving, and <laughs> okay, I'll have to take a moment and explain all this. Just it won't take me long. My news anchor on AgriTalk is Davis Michelson. Okay, his dad was Ron Michelson, who was an editor at Pro Farmer back in the late seventies and early eighties. And into the 90s as well for Ron. But in the 80s, Ron did something that was called the Pro Farmer Minute. And it was one minute of pro, of pro Farmer perspective out there on the different radio stations out there. We heard it as we were going down the road. Dad turned around, went home, did something in his risk management plan. It had that much of an impact on him that quick. I thought that's really cool. I had a conversation with Bob Kaufman about if I want to be the pro farmer editor someday, what do I need to do? He said, go through the journalism school at Iowa State University, ag journalism school, do it in broadcasting because it's a very conversational style that we write in and, uh, and stay in touch. I didn't have to stay in touch. My last week, finals week at Iowa State University, Bob called me and they had a job for me in Chicago. I spent three and a half years in Chicago, made my way back to Pro Farmer in Cedar Falls in 1991. And for 17 really, really cool years, from 1997 to 2014, I got to be the editor of Pro Farmer. And it was awesome. Awesome. Now I'm the host of AgriTalk. I'm taking what I learned at, at, at that time, and I turn it into a... a basically a daily newsletter. Uh, the four pages on the outside of, of the Pro Farmer newsletter were all about the issues and the business decisions and crop insurance and farm policy and ethanol and RFS and all of that stuff that, that impacts your bottom line. That was the four outside pages. The four inside pages were markets, market analysis, uh, risk management strategies, what to do about it, Morning hour of AgriTalk is policy and issues. Afternoon hour is market. So it's pro farmer every day. I love it. Wow, man, that is said with so much passion and energy. That's actually probably a great place to uh, <laughs> to wrap up, Chip. If people wanted to uh, learn more, how, where would they find you on social media? How do they find AgriTalk? Okay, on Twitter, it's uh, at AgriTalk or at Chip Flory. Uh that's about all the social media that I do. I don't do Facebook at agritalk.com. If you want to learn more about what agritalk is, we've got uh, all of it out there, agritalk.com. And of course, where all the apps are available, you can search for the agritalk app and uh, you can listen to it live. And it's a complete uh, archive of all of our shows right there. Well, Chip Flurry, thank you so much for uh, taking an extra hour of your day and uh, coming on to talk on the podcast. Vance, this was fun. I'm a big fan of yours, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>